I thought we'd begin today by revisiting a place we've been to a few times, the Redwoods of Northern California. Well, so what we are looking at here is a population of Redwoods, and that, of course, is still the topic that we're dealing with, is the topic of populations. So today we're going to begin by doing some calculations of what we will call a life table. And then we will do some other kinds of population calculations. And we'll finish up by moving on to a discussion of what it is that regulates populations. So let's descend into the topic of life tables. We see an example life table right here on this image. Notice the names of the columns. We start out with an age class column and because we're using a hypothetical population of cottontail rabbits here, years are the appropriate age class. So we're going from individuals that are less than one year old, an age class of zero, all the way up to four year olds. And then we come to the next column, which has a red one over it, which is the total population at our beginning time, that is when time equals zero. So we're starting out with 20 young of the year, and 10 one-year-olds, and 42-year-olds, and 33-year-olds, and by the time we get to four-year-olds, there's none left. So we have a total beginning population of 100. And that is simply a multiplication problem, multiplying column 1 by column 2. So 50% of 20 is 10. Notice that 10 is dropped a row, however, and that's because the young of the year by the next year are one-year-olds. And then 80% of 10 is 8 when they become two-year-olds and so on, which means that the number surviving out of that hundred the next year is a total of 38. The next column, column 4, is a column that measures fecundity. Fecundity we can define as the number of young produced per adult. So young of the year produce no young, but one-year-olds produce one young per adult. Two-year-olds produce three young per adult, and so on. And that brings us to column five, which is the number of offspring produced per age class. So to do this, we need to multiply column 3 times column 4. So for age class 1 year, the 10 individuals that survive to this next year each produce one young, so that counts to be 10 total offspring. And the two-year-olds, of which there are eight, they each produce three young, and so eight times three gives us 24 young, and so on. And if we add up all the numbers of young produced by the various age classes, it comes to be 74. And that brings us to the last column, column six, which is the total population that we find at the end of our observation. So when time equals t. So the total population at time equals t for young of the year is 74. That's the number of young that were produced during the course of the year. And then the total population of one-year-olds we read from column 3 is 10. And for two-year-olds, again, we read from column three, and that's eight, and so on. And then we add up all those individuals, and what we come up with is a population at time equals t of 112. 
So it's a very mechanical kind of a process. And it allows us to then keep track of what our population is going to be from year to year. So this kind of a set of pretty straightforward calculations is what is called a life table. So now let's move on and talk about how we might solve other kinds of population problems. The procedure that we're going to use is pretty much the exact same kind of procedure that you would have learned for solving word problems in freshman algebra. So let's look at this problem. And again, this is a hypothetical sort of a thing, but in any event, let's read this. An eastern milk snake population, and you see an eastern milk snake picture on this image here, is estimated to be 5,000 in the year 2003 and to have an annual growth rate of 4%. The rate slows to 3% for three years and to 2% for the next four years. So our question is, how large is the population in 2010? So the way that we do this, we first write down what we know, what is given in the problem. So we know that we have an initial population of 5,000. It has an initial growth rate of 4%. Growth rate in the next three years is 3%. And the growth rate in the following four years is 2% next thing we do is write out what we want to do, write out an equation in other words, in words. So we have final population equals initial population times a 3% growth rate for three years times a 2% growth rate for four years. Notice that our initial growth rate is irrelevant. 4% doesn't really figure in here. Now on to step 3, which is to take our English sentence and put it into the symbolic language of mathematics. P sub F stands for final population. Final population equals the initial population, 5,000, times 1.03 to the third. So we have to ask ourselves, where does that come from? Well, we have a 3% growth rate, but it's an increase every year. If we simply multiplied by 0.03, we would have a decrease. So we have to increase it to what's already there. So we have to put in the 1. And then we're going to do that for 3 years, so it's 3 to the 3rd. And using the same logic again, we multiply by 1.02 to the 4th power. Step four, we solve. So our final population goes out to be 5,914. And we have this graphed on this image as well. Notice that the slope of the line changes between the 3% and 2% growth rates. The slope becomes more shallow as the growth rate declines. Now let's move from mathematics back to concepts. Although, as we'll see, these concepts directly relate to those mathematics we were just doing. We're looking here at a baby short-tailed shrew that I found when I was turning over my compost pile last spring. As I did this, I found this nest with only little babies in it, so I took one out and took his picture, and then I had to take all those babies and their nest and work around it. Because it is a good thing to have shrews in the garden, because shrews eat insects. And so he was actually a very welcome visitor in my vegetable garden. And as far as I could tell, that family continued to live there for the rest of the summer, as I saw them scooting about every once in a while. Short-tailed shrews are a really common species 
in Eastern North America. And they occur in a whole variety of different kinds of situations, including in places like gardens. So let's talk about why I have this picture here. Shrews are little animals that get eaten by lots of other kinds of animals, especially things like owls, because shrews are out at night and owls are out at night. So this long-eared owl that you see here would be a likely predator on shrews. So we can think of what is it that regulates shrew populations. And to a significant degree, their populations get regulated by other kinds of animals, like predators. Other kinds of things that might regulate their populations would be things like disease and food. And so as their populations grow, you might expect that disease would become a larger factor in controlling their populations as disease more easily spreads from individual to individual. Food might become in limited supply if there were too many animals for the available food. And as they become more dense, predators be more likely to find them. So little animals like these are regulated by factors that we refer to as being density dependent. Let's compare a different kind of a situation. Now we're looking at an insect in the order Lepidoptera, what we commonly call butterflies. This particular one is a rather common one called the tiger swallowtail. And he is busily at work drinking nectar from flowers in my garden. And he's also, like the shrew, a very welcome member of my garden. So, can we say that the same kinds of factors that control the populations of shrews also control the populations of insects? Well, we might, and depending upon what species of insect we were talking about and what particular year we were considering, Yes, those same kinds of density-dependent factors might be playing a major role. However, with insects, often other kinds of factors play the deciding role in determining their populations. Things like minimum winter temperatures, things like amount of snow cover, a whole host of different sorts of physical phenomena that really aren't related to the size of a particular population, but to their physiological capabilities. Factors like these fall under the heading of density independent factors because they operate whether a population is abundant or rare. So we can summarize these sorts of ideas like this. Density-dependent factors are ones that operate as a consequence of how big a population is. So as population density increases, mortality tends to increase for a whole variety of reasons, and fecundity tends to decline. The reasons include things like predation, disease, availability of food, and competition. Density independent factors, in contrast, are those that operate independently of population size. So they include things like storms and geological events and winter temperature and snowfall and things like that. Let's extend this idea of density dependence a bit further. By looking at this little guy here, this is a eastern white-footed mouse, often referred to commonly as a field mouse, one of the most abundant small mammals on the continent of North America. Notice those bug eyes. He's got 
A lot of mammals that are out, out primarily at night have those real big eyes like that. This is another one of these little guys who is eaten extensively by a whole variety of predators. Tends to be rather short-lived in nature, although in captivity they can live for several years. I've kept them in captivity and had them live for the better part of 40 years. But they are lucky to make it to one year in the wild. And their numbers do fluctuate dramatically from year to year. They often, in fact, exhibit a cycle in terms of their numbers, where they build up over a series of years, maybe five years to seven years, to a population peak, and then they crash. And the crash is often due to density-dependent factors like disease and predation. So it's not uncommon for these animals to be extremely abundant some years, and then the next year there might be very few of them around. And this multi-year cycle is something that can repeat itself over and over and over again. Now, in addition to these multiple year cycles, we also observe in many of these small mammal populations annual cycles. So something like the white-footed mouse might build up to very large numbers over the course of the summer so that by fall they're at peak populations because they can raise a number of litters during the course of a year. However, once winter gets going, populations start to plummet as food begins to run out for these animals and as they get into poorer condition, disease starts taking them and predators start taking them so that by the end of the winter we may only have five or ten percent of the individuals left who started the winter. So let's take a look at another example and summarize. This is the redback vole, which is a swamp dwelling species. So even though this species lives in a very different habitat from the white-footed mouse, we can observe the same kinds of population cycles, both long-term over a series of years and annual cycles. And again, although populations can build to very high levels over a series of years due to various kinds of favorable conditions like good food crops and things like that, eventually they tend to just plummet from one year to the next. And again, this is often a consequence of something like disease. This little graph in this image here portrays that kind of a pattern over a series of years, showing the annual cycles and the longer term trends, building up to a crescendo in populations, followed by a precipitous drop off. We've been talking a lot about how predators can influence populations. And so let's focus specifically on that for a little bit. We're looking here at a wildebeest, which is a hoofed mammal, an ungulate, they're also referred to as, as a group, which is found in the savannas of East Africa. And even to this day, it remains a fairly common species. Now, like all hoofed mammals, they are subject to predation by large predators. So, for example, this guy here, the lion, is also present on the African savannas. And being a cooperative hunter, lions can bring down big prey like wildebeest. So, there is a relationship in densities 
that exists, another density-dependent relationship between predators and prey. And these are often referred to as simply that, predator-prey relationships. And the general pattern is that prey populations like wildebeest numbers go up. And then, in response to that population buildup of prey species, predator species start to build up. As there's more food available for the predators, they have higher survivorship of their young, and so predator populations start to build. And there are many, many examples of this in nature. Now, not surprisingly, if we graph predator and prey populations, what we see is a lag time between these two population cycles. So prey populations have to build up first, and then it takes a while for the predator populations to respond to that. So let's look at an actual image of all this. So in this graph here, we can see that lag time between prey population cycles and predator population cycles. This one highlights a little bit different example. This one highlights the relationship between the red fox and the cottontail rabbit. In this case, as cottontail rabbit numbers grow, then the red fox numbers would grow. Another famous example, same kind of an idea, is the moose in the northern parts of North America and the wolf. As moose populations grow, wolf populations grow. And then as they decline, the wolf, wolf populations also decline. Now I've actually observed on my own property one of these population cycles with a bit of a twist to it, in fact, so it's worth pointing it out. In this case I had a family of gray foxes who lived behind my barn. They built their den in the woods right behind the barn, in fact. Gray foxes, as you might guess from their name, do average grayer than the red fox, and they also don't have that white tip on their tail. And what I also observed during their tenure was that populations of eastern cottontails, a principal prey item of foxes, declined until they pretty much disappeared from everywhere on my property. And then, not long thereafter, the gray foxes disappeared as well. So, as their prey declined, the predator, the gray fox, also disappeared. However, in this case, there was probably also an additional factor. About the same time that the cottontails were disappearing, a distemper epidemic started moving through our area, and foxes are very susceptible to distemper, and it has high mortality when it's contracted. So when you have a large population of predators, large population of foxes, the efficiency of disease transmission goes up quite a bit. And so it is also possible that distemper took away a lot of these animals. It's impossible to know without having actually captured the animals and examined them, but those are both probably contributing factors to this appearance and then disappearance of foxes on my property. Now that we know that populations change over time, the next question we might ask is, how do we go about measuring that change? How do we know how big a population is at any point in time? There are techniques that exist for doing this, and we will discuss several of these. What we're looking at in this photograph here is one of the kinds of techniques to actually have wild individuals that we mark. So this individual here, this is a Guam rail species that we were working on reestablishing into the wild. It had become extinct in the wild because of an introduced predator. And so we were trying to establish a population on an island where birds hadn't occurred before. So establishing a new population. And in this case, 
Before we release the individuals, we mark them all with aluminum numbered bands around their legs. And so once you have a population of marked individuals, you can follow that over time and find out whether or not unmarked individuals, reproduction starts occurring. And then you can start making estimates of population size from that. Now we'll actually talk more about the details of all that in the next program. So for right now at least, let's focus on this particular species and what we did with it. The Guam rail is a species which occurred originally only on Guam historically, probably occurred on other islands prehistorically, however. And so our idea was to try to reestablish it back on islands where it prehistorically probably once occurred in places where that introduced predator was not present. Now because they were extirpated in the wild that meant all we had to deal with were captive raised birds. And captive raised birds do tend to be far more naive than wild birds. They don't know about finding wild food, they haven't been shown things by their parents in the wild, they don't know so much about predators, they are in a whole host of ways just not as good at taking care of themselves as wild bred individuals are. However, that's what we had to deal with and so the concept was that we would keep inoculating this island with birds until some of them took using a statistical approach where if we did this experiment often enough eventually we might hope that some particularly wily individuals would manage to persist and start a new population. Now notice also that this individual has a radio transmitter attached to his back. In addition to being able to measure population size by knowing about marked versus unmarked individuals, we can also gather different kinds of information by being able to track the movements of individuals, find out something about how they're setting up a home range, what kind of areas they're living in, and a variety of different kinds of pieces of information that one can get by knowing where individuals are from day to day and even hour to hour. So in any event, after trying this experiment several times with quite a few different birds that were captive raised, they do breed readily in captivity, we had very disappointing results for all those kinds of reasons of dealing with naive birds. We had birds being eaten by feral cats, another introduced predator on this island, usually not so much a, of a problem as the one that the species was dealing with on its home island of Guam, which was an introduced snake. But some individuals were preyed on, but more commonly individuals were simply not finding enough food, so they were dying. Even though they were surrounded by food, they didn't recognize it. And we also dealt with surprising kinds of issues like birds falling off cliffs. This is a flightless bird and so it doesn't have the option to fly. And so at least one individual simply tumbled to his death by being so naive about the nature of the landscape. So in any event this project did not turn out too well in its first several manifestations. But of course, when you do projects like this, you do learn things about what to do and what not to do. And so future attempts at reestablishing this bird will make use of that kind of information. And at this point, I think we will close. Next time, we will investigate population measuring in quite a bit more detail.